All right, let's go ahead and get started. Are there any questions before we begin? So I'm still planning on treating it like a normal week. I know it's Thanksgiving, but we still meet for Monday, Wednesday, and no one has told me that they're traveling, so we'll just do our quiz, probably like normal, at least that's my plan so far. And then check your grades, so I should have handed back everything to you that I have. I do have two homeless, homeworks up at the front. One of them has been homeless for a while, and the other is recently homeless. So let me know if those are yours so I can put them into the grade book. But otherwise, check your grades, make sure it's accurate, everything's entered in, all the assignments. And if something's missing, of course, email me ASAP so I can either hunt down your assignment or uh, fix the grade if I handed it back without entering it or with the wrong grade or something. All right, so let's finish up last chapter. So we didn't quite finish uh, last week's chapter about all the different properties. So that was our intermolecular forces and we have to do the energetics of melting. But let's just finish off with surface tension and where we were, so kind of a refresher. So we did that demo and we saw how the water really has strong cohesive forces. And so we see, right, this is a basis of surface tension. And so basically, right in summary, so stronger, I'll put stronger intermolecular forces, so that was between molecules equals greater surface tension. And again, we saw that right with our water, which has hydrogen bonding. And so let's remind ourselves, so IE water that has H bonding. And of course, right, all of them. So it still has dipole-dipole, since it is polar, still has van der Waals. But we saw again in our demo how that had a really strong surface tension compared to we did that molecule cyclohexane. And we can look at a picture of cyclohexane. So I drew it on the board kind of quickly. But it's basically this structure. So it looks flat in this drawing. It's not really flat. So this is a better structured uh, 3D representation, so you can kind of tell the shape. But again, it's basically nonpolar, this cyclohexane. So we're kind of looking at that, right? So a bunch of carbon, hydrogen, those aren't really polar. And so, right, that whole molecule is then nonpolar, which gave it pretty weak intermolecular forces. So this was nonpolar. So it probably only has, right, our van der Waals AKA our London dispersion, so whatever term we use for that. And so that's why that cyclohexane kind of splued, splued, uh, spilled over right away. And so, right, this also tells us why, like, a paperclip can float on water. So if we were to just compare densities, the paperclip should not float because it is more dense than water. But since this paperclip has little holes in it, it's able to, of course, take advantage of surface tension. So same thing, uh, those different like lizards that walk on water. This came up in uh, my oceanography class while that video loads. And so pretty related to this is vapor pressure. And so vapor pressure is just defined as the pressure exerted by the vapor when it's in dynamic equilibrium. And so all that is saying, so any sort of, right, beaker of water, so let's just say this is water, for instance. And so, right, even though it looks like it's just sitting there, so it's still in some sort of equilibrium with the atmosphere. And so some molecules of H2O, right, do kind of float away. And you, you know that, right? So if you leave a glass of water out forever, 
it'll eventually keep evaporating all the way to nothingness. And so if we compare that, so I'm going to use kind of ether as an example. But if you guys are not familiar with ether, try to think of some other organic that you're familiar with. So I would add to this like alcohol, like you're drinking alcohol. So you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever sniffed like alcohol or like even if you're cooking wine, right? You open up that wine and it kind of hits you with that ethanol vapor. So all that is from your vapor pressure, right? That's why you kind of get hit with it. And so I, I use ether because ether in the summertime, especially, you know, if you just gotten a delivery of your can of ether, you bring it inside the lab and then you pop it open, you get hit in the face with just all this vapors of ether coming out. And so, again, this all goes back to our intermolecular forces. And so, of course, right, the weaker the force is, the more molecules will be in the vapor. So, again, that's why I brought up ether, right? So, it doesn't have, or even these alcohols, so ether. So, that would be polar, but still, right, relatively high uh, vapor pressure. So, a lot of these ethers have low boiling points of, like, 36 degrees Celsius. So, not too much warmer than room temperature. And then alcohols, so even though the alcohols, right, they do have hydrogen bonding, but, right, we could put only one, though, usually. We're just looking at, like, ethanol, so I'll redraw ethanol for us. And so, again, right, they have a little bit higher vapor pressure than, let's just say, water with our two hydrogen bonds that we're kind of comparing. And so, again, the main takeaway, the weaker the forces, the higher the vapor pressure. And, of course, right, higher vapor pressure, sometimes we use this term volatile. And, again, that's usually for, like, uh, low-boiling organics. So I'll just put, like, pentane is usually considered volatile. Put ether on there again. So that's just kind of the examples you might encounter in your lab. And so then here's this term, normal boiling point. And so normal boiling point, again, that just corresponds to 760 degrees, uh, sorry, 760 tor, so with our pressure. And so let's kind of look at this graph. And so all this graph is showing us is vapor pressure versus temperature for different substances. And so, of course, you can kind of see this general trend, obviously, as temperature rises, right, that vapor pressure increases. That makes sense. Greater temperature gets those molecules moving. But then this is what defines kind of the boiling point of every substance. So what is uh, basically where the vapor pressure meets up with our ATM. So, right, this is the same as one ATM. So when our vapor pressure equals the pressure of our atmosphere, that's considered boiling point. And so, of course, right, even with water, so we can look at water at, let's just say, 80 degrees Celsius. And so, right, it has a vapor pressure of just above 400 torr. So, again, that kind of gives you a sense of, obviously, right, more temperature, faster, greater evaporation, even if it's not boiling. Yeah, I think that's really all. And so maybe on an exam, you might be asked to identify, like, what the boiling point would be based off of this graph. So water, it's 100, you know, ethanol. It's 78, so again, just wherever it crosses that 760 tor or 1 ATM line there. Questions about vapor pressure or anything? I'll just play this video. If this will play. So this is just an example of those lizards that walk on water. OK. 
come on. Alright, we'll go back to this. I don't know why YouTube is being... Costa Rican basilisk lizards are looking for food. Basilisks have been nicknamed the Jesus Christ lizard. Why? This adult male, probably the father of the young lizards, can't tell us. Nor can this female, exclusive property of the territorial male. It has nothing to do with the feeding habits of the basilisk, which consists primarily of insects and berries. This predatory reptile will help reveal the secret as it stalks the young basilisk. The basilisk is called the Jesus Christ lizard because it can walk, well, really run on water. So all that, right, that's all back due to our surface tension. And of course, right, it's moving fast too, so it doesn't fall down into the water. All right, last little bit of our chapter. And so now we have to go through the map. I know everyone's favorite part. And so now we'll go through kind of the energetics of melting. And so you kind of saw this in your lab. So you saw, right, any time that kind of this heat um, plateau, this heat curve, any time you had a plateau, that meant that you were doing some sort of state change. And then once it finished the state change, then your substance either continued to rise, or of course, if you were going the other way, so we could take this the other way, it would still plateau at the same amount, and then of course, keep cooling. And so we'll, we'll need to break that down. And so let's kind of look at our big ideas. So first we'll kind of relate our uh, substance to our change in temperature to give us Q. So kind of what's going on here. So this is based off of our increase in temperature. And so this is just telling us very generally, again, we'll go through an example all together, but we'll have some sort of substance, in this case, water, but then it has a specific heat or a heat capacity And so all this tells us is basically how much energy does it take to raise our degree of one gram by one degree Celsius. And so that's the CS. So of course you have to look this up for every substance. And then it'll be multiplied by the mass and times our change in temperature. And units could vary, again, if you're given a specific heat capacity in like moles or something, but usually it will be and some sort of grams per degree Celsius. And so we'll look at that. And then we'll also have to kind of look into these different state changes. And so that's given with this information. So we have different ones. So we have our heat of fusion. And so this is going to be for either melting or, of course, we're going the other direction, right, crystallizing or solidifying. Or solidifying. I... And so all this is telling us is, again, usually it's in moles. So, again, you might look this up on somewhere else, and it could be given in a different unit. So it could be grams. But usually it's given in one mole of solid. And it's just how much is required to do that state change, how much energy. And of course, right, if you're going in the forward direction, if you're melting, it's endothermic, aka you're adding heat. And then of course, if you're going in reverse, then it's going to be negative. And so again, right, crystallization is equal to melting, obviously just different signs. So again, melting, adding heat, crystallization, losing heat. 
And then we also have our heat of vaporization, which is kind of shown on here. And so again, appreciate the large difference, and that kind of makes sense. And so obviously, right, it's going to take a lot more energy to get things into the gas phase compared to going from the solid to liquid phase. And so right, delta H of vaporization, so you can put this as for uh, either evaporation then, or of course going back down, right, condensation. And then who knows what sublimation is? What is that again? What is that process or an example? What does that just mean, generally speaking? Anybody remember? So sublimation, that's when you go from directly from a solid to a gas. And so this doesn't occur too much. Uh, sometimes you could give, obviously, a word problem with a weird scenario. Uh, some common examples are dry ice, for instance, right? So you buy that, it's in its solid state, and then it goes directly to the gas phase. We also mentioned that iodine, so that would be elemental iodine, that also does that. But let's just say you're doing a sublimation problem, and they don't give you, right, the delta H of sublimation, so they often don't. But you can always just say that your delta H of sublimation is equal to your fusion plus your vaporization, since it's those two phase changes. So just keep that in mind if that comes up. All right, so let's go through this whole shebang and kind of go through it step by step. And so let's first take an overall look at this problem and what it wants us to do. And then, like I said, we'll go through all these little steps. And so basically, we're going to go through this heating curve here. And so we're going to start all the way at ice at negative 25 degrees Celsius. And we want to see how much energy does it take for that one mole of ice to turn into one mole of steam all the way at 125 degrees Celsius. And so we have to kind of break this down one little leg at the time, which is what they've done here. And so our first step is we have to just take that ice to zero degrees to melt it. And so let's look at that. And so remember that takes you back to this Q equation since you're doing, right, you're changing temperature. And so again, let's look at what we're given. So we have our uh, heat capacity here. So it's given by this number. So it's a little bit lower for ice than it is for water. So water is about 4.19, I want to say. We'll look at the number later. Joules per gram degree Celsius, but ice is a little bit lower, so it's 2.09. So that's important to keep in mind when you do these separately. Kind of a pain, but probably on an, an exam, I would give you right every specific heat that you would need and every melting point, so you're not you know, trying to Google around like crazy. And so in this case, right, it's given to us the heat capacity in joules per gram degrees Celsius. But then they told us we only had a mole. So they converted, right, mass to, or moles to mass. So of course, if it's just water, that's 18 grams per mole. And then our change in temperature, so that would be right from negative 25 degrees Celsius to zero. So delta T is 25. And so that's how they got that number here. Let me turn on my calculator. And I'll punch it in just so we're all on the same page. Again, just watching your units in these sorts of cases. And so we had 18 grams. 
times our 2.09 for our heat capacity and times our change in temperature. And so again, this is in joules. So this number it spits out is in joules. And so we got their same answer of 941 joules, roughly. And they converted it to kilojoules, which we might want for later. All right, so we've taken our one mole to zero degrees Celsius. And so now we're at the state change, right? So we can look up a substance. You can see its melting point. And so once we're at the melting point, so once we take it to the melting point, now we have to do the state change. And so that's what's going on here. So state change. And so now we plug in the information for state change. So that's just related, related to your heat of fusion. And so you can look up your heat of fusion for water. So that's 6.02 kilojoules per mole to do the state change. So we're in moles. So we can just multiply those two numbers. So, of course, 1 times 6.02 kilojoules per mole leaves us with 6.02 kilojoules. Questions so far? I just don't want to go too fast on this because there's a lot of steps. All right, so we're all okay with this and so right we're at leg two so now we're saying okay well now we did our state change so now we're right here and so now we have to take it from zero all the way to our next state change right which is our boiling point so let's do that let's take it from zero to a hundred and figure out how much energy that requires and so now that's this step so now we have our new specific heat for our liquid state. And so that's that 4.18 that we're probably familiar with water having, if we've heard it before. So mass, so again, now we're back to this formula. So because of our specific heat, we'll convert our moles to mass once again. So we have 18 times 4.18. And then write our delta T is, of course, 100. So we went 100 uh, from 0 to 100. And so now let's plug this in. So 18 times 4.18 times 100. And again, it's in joules, right, from our heat capacity. And so we get 7,524 joules. So they rounded to three sig figs, so we can say we agreed with their answer. So questions on this? Still okay. And so now, right now we're back at this point, at our boiling point, so we're at 100. That means it's state change time again. So that brings us to segment four. So now let's just mark this. So, okay, we need to do another state change. So we can say liquid to gas to help us. And so if we're going from liquid to gas, that's why we need our delta H uh, vaporization for that. And so they gave us the number of 40.7. And again, right, we can go back up to here and see, yes, that's probably what the answer is. And again, right, it's a lot larger than our fusion number. So a lot of energy at this step. And so, right, since our vaporization is given in kilojoules per mole, we already have moles. So we can just multiply our one times 40.7 kilojoules per mole to leave us with 40.7 kilojoules. All right, so feeling good about that. And of course, I like how they, they accurately show this out. So again, you can appreciate how much energy that takes. So right, a lot of energy in that last state change. 
And so the last little bit is, well, okay, now we're here. We're at the gas phase, but we want to take that gas to 125 degrees Celsius. And so now that's that last little bit. And so notice, right, we have to get another heat capacity for water in its steam phase. And so you could find that information. So now the heat capacity is 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. So we still have a mole. So we can still use 18. So we have 18 grams. I'll plug this one in. So 18 times our new heat capacity, so 2.01. And then our delta T. So again, we're taking it to 125, so 125 minus 100, so times 25 there. And so we get 904 joules, which is 0 0.904 kilojoules. And so now the final question of this problem should be then, so what was the total energy... Required to go from negative 25 degrees Celsius to 125 degrees Celsius with one mole of water. And so really this would be how an exam question is phrased and then you kind of have to break it down into all these steps. And so now let's do the final addition. So we'll go back to the beginning. And so we had our leg one. So that was 0 0.941. And now I'm going to go in kilojoules just to make the math a little easier. Then plus 6.02 kilojoules. And then plus, so then we did our warming up the water, our liquid water. So plus 7.52 kilojoules. Then we did our state change, so plus 40.7. And then we took it to 125, so plus 0.904. So I get 56 kilojoules roughly for the total, so probably round it to three six figs, 56.1. Everybody roughly get that? So 56.1 kilojoules in of total energy. Any questions about that? And then other like important things would be again to kind of you know look at a diagram of this, kind of determine you know where are the melting points, where are the boiling points, where are the state changes. And so that's just something you want to be able to do. So of course, right down here we have solid. This leg, it's all liquid. And of course, right, this would be gas. And then just being able to identify the legs. So of course, if this is our melting point, then we have melting freezing going on here. So melting, freezing. And then on this leg, right, evaporation, condensation. So as long as you feel good about that, then hopefully it should be okay. All right, any other thoughts about chapter seven before we start our solution chapter?
Okay, give me a second. I thought I loaded your notes, but I guess I didn't load them. All right, so now we're looking at solution chemistry. And so you'll see with solutions, kind of our stoichiometry comes back up. So if you have your mole highway, you might want to have that at least somewhat handy. So it kind of tells you how to go from concentration to moles as well. And so let's just talk about, well, what is a solution and what are all these things? And so, of course, you can mix table salt with water, and the salt seems to disappear. And, of course, we end up right with some sort of homogenous mixture where it looks all the same throughout. And, of course, right, the salt's there. We know it. We can taste it. It tastes gross. We could separate it back out, right, by performing some sort of distillation. And so these homogeneous mixtures are often called solutions, and you've worked with a ton of them all throughout the your time here without knowing it. So every little dropper bottle, you know, your silver nitrate, and they all have that little molarity thing on that, all those are solutions. And so in our class, we mainly work with aqueous solutions, again, in our dropper bottles. And so what does that mean if it's aqueous? Yeah, so dissolved in water, and so that means, right, our solvent is H2O for aqueous. And then, so that makes everything else the minor component or the solute, so, right, the, whether that's silver nitrate or sodium acetate today, whatever sodium hydroxide, we could obviously go crazy naming all our possible minor components, but that's just what's being dissolved. So I'll put a few, so NaOH, um, sodium acetate. Uh, silver nitrate, again, we could go really crazy with all these potential solutions. So excellent. And of course, right, we can have other solutions uh, such as where you have like an organic as a solvent, but in general, we usually talk about aqueous solutions for our purposes here. And so then we kind of have this special mixture called our colloidal mixtures. And so what defines a colloidal mixture? And so with a colloidal mixture, the particles have to be large enough to scatter light. And so this is often called the Tyndall effect. And you probably have seen some examples. So for example, you could have a gas liquid phase, like a liquid aerosol. And so right, that's gonna be fog or mist. And so you probably know what I'm talking about without knowing it with this Tyndale effect. And so think about it with the fog, right? So you, you have fog and right, it's hard to see when it's foggy. It's hard to know like where the light's coming from. And that's because right, all those fog, all the little water molecules, they're all kind of scattering the light and causing that effect. So you can also kind of see that with dust, right? So if you've ever, um, you know, you smack the couch and then all the little dust particles fly into the air. And if, you know, the light's streaming in just right, you can see all those little particles and of course, again, those particles are large enough to scatter light. And so other colloidal mixtures that you probably weren't even aware were colloidal mixtures are like whipped cream and shaving cream. So those are different mixtures. You can also have, of course, paint, but like mayonnaise would be considered an emulsion. So that's like a liquid liquid emulsion. And of course, again, paints come up again, so different pigments, obviously those are all some sort of uh, solution. So ink and blood can also be considered a colloidal mixture. 
pumice stones. Of course, pumice stones have the little gas holes left over. And cheese can be a, an example. Same thing, right? Gelatin. And then other mixtures are, of course, like gemstones. So all those can be considered colloidal mixtures. All right, so now let's kind of look into, well, why do things dissolve? And we'll, again, kind of focus on our aqueous solutions. And so we're kind of back at this idea of, well, why, why does salt form a nice mixture? And, like, why does sugar dissolve? So how do solids dissolve? And so have you heard this like dissolves like before in your classes? And so like dissolves like. And so this is based upon the intermolecular forces. So kind of similarity in intermolecular forces. And also polarity is what it's referring to. So we'll look at some examples. And so this is just what happens when a solute dissolves. And so this is kind of cool. And so you have to think about, and let's just think about sodium chloride for instance. So right, we have NaCl. Obviously, these, this is all just one molecule. But let's think about sodium chloride. And so, of course, right, we've said, well, sodium chloride, they're ionic. And so they're just held together by those electrostatic interactions and, of course, also the stability of the crystal lattice structure. But like we mentioned, of course, our water is pretty polar. So it comes along. It has those lone pairs. We can write our partial negative, right? These hydrogens are partial positive, again, from our hydrogen bonding and, of course, water being polar. And so as long as the solvent-solute interactions are strong enough, and so, right, sodium is going to be attracted to our oxygen and chlorine to our hydrogen. And so if our solvent-solute interactions are stronger than the solute-solute, then they dissolve, and so that's what mainly drives our dissolution. And so you can see with your solubility rules, right, so there are obviously some cases where uh, that's what makes things insoluble. Basically, you know, for our silver chloride, let's just say as one example, or it's not soluble. So obviously, right, these solvent-solute interactions aren't too strong compared to the uh, solute-solute, a.k.a. your silver to chlorine interactions. And so there's probably something to do with, like, the radius of silver and how it binds them. And so, that, again, that's kind of what drives those trends. So blah, blah, blah. So we looked at that. So there's sodium chloride dissolving in water. So we'll look at, I'll probably bring an electrolyte demonstration. But let's do another, let's kind of think of another example with this like dissolves like. And so I had mentioned, so do you remember why I said like don't use hexanes last week in class because they're not great for you? Well, let's at least talk about hexanes. So why are hexanes used to clean up oil? And so that goes back to the like dissolves like property. So let's look up an oil. And so let's just look at oleic acid, for instance. And so this starts to get into a little bit of biochemistry. And so we can talk about some different 
fats here. So this is not a saturated fat. So I think it's technically called a monounsaturated fat. And well, what the heck does that all mean? And so let's just look at, so right, a hexane. That's just a six carbon chain. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's our six carbon chain. And so for right now, we're comparing it to a monounsaturated fat. And so monounsaturated just means that it has this one double bond here, right? But look at the rest of the structure of this oleic acid, right? It kind of looks like hexane, just straight carbon chain. That's kind of what we're getting at here. And so what we're saying, again, like dissolves like. So most of this molecule, so of course it still has this N that's polar, but for fatty acids, right, they start getting into these really long chains. So this is still considered pretty nonpolar, this oleic acid. And so, right, they would dissolve one another since they're both mainly nonpolar. And so that's, again, what we mean by like dissolves like. So we're kind of looking at these structures. And so we can look at other fats as well. I'm trying to find, let's find a saturated fat. And so just for clarity, like this one, palmitic acid. So this would be a saturated fat. Again, saturated just means that every carbon has all the hydrogens attached to it, so there's no double bonds or anything. And so, of course, right, this would again be soluble by hexanes or another straight chain organic that looks pretty similar to it, right? But then these are not miscible in water, since again, they're pretty nonpolar. So that's why, right, our oils and water do not mix, for instance. So that's right, our common saying. All right, so this kind of goes through, again, the water. But I feel like we've kind of belabored this point a lot. So Wednesday, I'll try to bring in the demo for this. But you did see this in lab, but we can, again, look at it again. So in lab, right, you tested kind of the conductivity with the salt. You saw how it lit up while the sugar either barely gave a light with if there was enough contamination or maybe gave no light. And so what does that mean when we have an electrolyte solution versus a non-electrolyte? There's kind of one key word there that we can use. Let's see if we remember. You remember, what do electrolytes do in solution that non-electrolytes do not? So remember, they disassociate. This, uh, so, right? So anything that is an electrolyte, remember how they disassociate. 
So we can write that. So we've kind of been doing this in lab where we can write them disassociating. So of course, write sodium chloride or any ionic compound disassociates. So we could do that, right? Magnesium sulfate would do the same. So our ionic compound. And then again, sugar. So sugar does not, so it's more a discrete molecule or, you know, something else. So I'm going to look up another molecule. Let's ever load. Okay, so like aspirin, right, would not dis disassociate in solution. So sugar, any molecule, right, so molecules tend not to disassociate. And so we've left out organic acids for now, but we'll touch on them. And so again, electrolyte solutions. So now we can say, well, how can we further classify them? And so again, we have a strong electrolyte. And all this means is that it completely disassociates. And so one example, again, they put calcium chloride, but you could pretty much list, you know, any other ionic compound. And so now let's look at this one, so weak electrolytes. And so weak electrolytes, all that is saying is we have partial disassociation. And so here we have formic acid. And so let's look at this. And so some example of weak electrolytes are going to be organic acids. There's a few others or any other weak acid, but right now we don't know what a weak acid is. So we have to come back to this. And so this is what formate is, an organic acid. And so let's kind of look at that. And so this little structure, so we just have one carbon. So it looks like this. So this is formic acid, so very small. So one carbon. And then notice something you might want to be able to start identifying is this. So our carboxylic acid group, this will help you later at least, especially if you were to go on to other chemistries or ochem later. And so this carboxylic acid group, it has what's called this acidic proton. And so in solution, what that means is that your water is going to come along and it's going to want to pick up this proton. And so of course water has these lone pairs it's going to attack this proton. The electrons in this OH bond go back to our O here. And so that gives us, again, what they drew up here, but let's just kind of put the structure to it. So there's a CHOO negative, so that would be this species kind of floating around in solution. And then they just put H+, plus, but we really don't have H+, plus just naked in solution. So it's really hydronium, but chemists use uh, hydronium and H plus pretty interchangeably. So I'll just kind of put that there so we know they're really the same thing. And so again, this is our partial disassociation that we usually see with these weak electrolytes. And again, we'll name more weak acids when we study acids uh, next week. And so again, we have our electrolyte solutions. And so anything strong is fully disassociated. So again, sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte. And so acids are bases, which we'll start touching on, but again, we'll cover them better next week. So depending on the identity, so we'll go through later who's who, what's what, but for example, HCl is a strong acid, so that's going to fully disassociate. Other strong acids would be like nitric, 
acid or we'll see we have a lot of those like multiprotic acids but like let's just take sulfuric so the first disassociation is usually the strong one and then the rest would have some sort of equilibrium but we'll go into our acids uh, next week a little bit more in depth and so again, what defines a strong acid is not how much it hurts you, but rather, again, whether it disassociates. So HCl is our strong acid. It disassociates completely in water. And then so we did some titration with vinegar today. And so I just want to draw out vinegar and kind of show that. And so vinegar is, of course, this funky formula, which can be written in different ways, but basically two carbons. And so, right, C2, so two carbons. And then here's the H3 that's located there. This H is our acidic proton, our OH. And so, again, we write this kind of equilibrium. We could draw the water coming on. I like drawing this just for mechanism's sake. It's good practice for y'all. Ooh, I went crazy there, what I was doing. And so then we make our acetate ion here. And right, it's like sodium acetate you've seen before, uh, plus Hydronium. Wow, your class ends at 2, right? Or no? 250, okay. I'm. Why did I think we started? Okay. So I have another hour, right? Okay. I totally was like losing my mind for a second. And so let's mention one more. Sorry, I thought we were like almost out of time for some reason. And so, like I said, we'll cover it next week. But this is one that I think it's always interesting. So, for example, HF is a weak acid. And I think this always surprises people because HF is one of those pretty dangerous compounds. I would put this on my list of chemicals I probably won't work with unless I really, really would need to. And so, right, have I told you why HF is super dangerous? So HF, the problem with HF is that you might not notice it when it gets on you, but it will end up dissolving right through your skin and it ends up dissolving your bone. And so the, the problem is if it dissolves part of your bone or something, and so right, your bone's obviously made of calcium, then that calcium is floating around in your bloodstream and then it can re-solidify somewhere else and of course cause some sort of problem. Obviously, you know, where it ends up, it could cause stroke, heart attack. So that's the problem with HF. And so you have to keep this uh, calcium compound nearby. So if you do ever get any on you, you know, immediately put that calcium uh, antidote on you. But Right, it's still considered a weak acid just because of its equilibrium. So super dangerous, but it's a weak acid because again, it just does not fully disassociate. And so I'll write it like this. So kind of, and again, our equilibrium arrow shows that it does not fully disassociate. So it does not fully disassociate. So again, that's really that what defines a weak and a strong acid, not how dangerous it is. And so continuing, so again, our non-electrolyte solutions. So we said that most molecules are going to be non-electrolytes except, of course, for these acids and bases. So that's where I mentioned those organic acids as usually your most common example. And we won't get into all the organic bases. And so again, right, non-electrolyte solution going to be a molecule. And 
So I'll try to bring in our demo so we can see our light bulb light up of our sugar versus our weak acid versus either a strong acid or a sodium chloride or some other ionic compound. And so we've kind of looked at this since we needed to look at our solubility. And so like we saw, so not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. And so we have these solubility rules for that. And so I probably won't go over this too much right now since we've kind of looked at it. But again, this has to be done experimentally. So that's kind of some things to take away, right, is there's no chemist that's like, you know, automatically calculating these things. So needs to be experimental. And so you can kind of, you probably looked at your list. I have copies if people need it, not on me, but in my office. But you can Again, kind of see our group one is always soluble. We have nitrates and acetates as well as always soluble. And then obviously we've gone through our exceptions. So usually our heavy metals are insoluble. So our silver, mercury, lead, sulfate. Again, we saw the same thing. This time with group some group two and then also heavy metals where they're insoluble. And then all these are generally insoluble except of course some exceptions obviously the group one and then notice right these group two you could have some discrepancies and again in this class we won't go into the math but if you wanted to really quantify how much was soluble and get into the nitty-gritty take my 200 level all right let's do this little exercise so at least we can be all on the same page so looking at your solubility rules or looking at the ones on the board, determine whether these four compounds are insoluble or not. So take a few minutes, ask your neighbors. So you've had some practice with this, but... Mm -hmm.
All right, let's hear what you've got. So what do we think about lead chloride? So soluble, insoluble. So insoluble, is that what everybody got? So excellent, so insoluble. We saw that from your rules here. All right, what about B, copper chloride? Soluble. Soluble, is that what everybody got? You can give me excellent thumbs up. Looks good. Calcium nitrate, soluble, insoluble. Soluble. And then our last one, barium sulfate, what do we think? Excellent, insoluble. So not too bad there. It looks like everybody got those. Any questions on those ones? And so now we just have this graph here. And so again, you probably have noticed this, if, especially you know, if you're ever trying to dissolve sugar or something. And so in general, for most solids, the solubility of the solid increases as the temperature increases. And you kind of saw that in lab too, right? How things for the most part tended to clear up when you put them in hot water. And of course, there are some exceptions. So for example, this compound here, cerium sulfate. So I'm not entirely sure why. I've tried to look it up before in the past, but haven't found a good explanation. So, But for some reason, right, this one actually decreases in solubility. So there has to be you know, something about those solute-solute interactions getting stronger. Kind of interesting there. But for most of the other substances, again, all we're appreciating is increasing solubility with increasing temperature. And of course, you can predict whether something will dissolve and of course, whether you have a saturated solution, so on the line right at that limit of solubility. Unsaturated would be below or if you have, you know, a super saturated solution. And maybe you've made this, you know, to make like rock candy or something like that. You can get that super hot sugar solution. And so gases are the opposite of solids. So you might want to put that somewhere. So gases, right, opposite. And so, right, we just finished saying, well, solids increase solubility with temperature. But now if we look, well, gases have a lower solubility in water. And then for all gases, the solubility of the gas decreases as the temperature increases. And so with these different phases, so, right, we have a gas in solution. And so, of course, heating it up causes the gas to come out of the solution. And right, our delta H is exothermic since we do not need to overcome our solute-solute interactions. So again, right, the gas are pretty loosely bound anyway, so that makes sense. And so you can also observe this. So if you pour out warm soda, it's going to appear right really fizzy, but it's going to go flat pretty quickly, right, as all those gases escape versus pouring out a cold soda. So, right, it looks not as fizzy, but of course, all the gases are still dissolved in there. And so, how can we make our solvent hold more solute? And of course, we can either vary the temperature or the pressure. And so again, without knowing it or not, you may have done this before. Rock candy or other solutions that you made. And we also looked at right supersaturated solutions. You can think of your sodium acetate crystals as well. 
that we played with that little substance in lab that we were trying to crystallize. So that was, you know, really super saturated solution. So we heated that up, got it nice and hot, cooled it down, and got it to crystallize. And so, right, these super saturated solutions, they tend to be kind of unstable and lose all the solute above saturation when disturbed. So you can, you know, shake a carbonated beverage to get more fizz. Uh, and so you can also see this again with things like crystallizing really quickly with like your sodium acetate. And so sometimes people can do like weird like freeze water bottle tricks that you've seen on the internet where like people freeze like a water bottle instantly or something. So a lot of that has to do with like a super saturated solution or something. And then obviously you perturb those conditions and they tend to crystallize or not. And so now, right, how is your soda made? Or maybe, I don't know if anybody does any like brewing at home or anything. No, no brewers in here. And so basically, every gas has a Henry's Law constant. So this would just be something you can look up in, online or in a data table. And so let's just look at CO2. And so all this is saying, and so let's look at our units. So our KH for CO2 at 25 degrees Celsius, so how much is soluble, is 3.8 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity per ATM. Well, what's, what's this telling us? Well, it's telling us, right, we can figure out how much gas is in solution in molarity, right? And it's based upon however high the pressure is. So then we end up with this little equation here. So our solubility, so this is going to be some answer in molarity. And, well, we actually haven't talked about molarity, but this is just basically some sort of concentration unit. And we'll uh, figure out how much is soluble by multiplying our KH times whatever pressure we're at. So obviously, right, like your can of soda is, of course, uh, canned under some sort of CO2 pressure to get it all nice and bubbly. And then obviously when you release it, you hear that little pss, and right, that's your CO2 being released there. All right, so now let's look at all our solutions. So we're starting to get into the math. And so we just kind of have, right, these terms, dilute, concentrated. They're not really well defined. I kind of define dilute as anything less than, oops, less than three molarity. And then concentrated tends to be kind of above three molarity. Again, that's kind of general rule of thumb. And Obviously, our concentration tells us some sort of amount of solute in a given solution. And so now let's actually get into the details of all this and the math, the fun part. And so we'll, this is kind of our cheat sheet, I'll say, and then we'll go over these more slowly. But this would be a good, you know, kind of summary of what's going on. And so we'll look at molarity first. And molarity, we've seen a lot in labs. So that's just moles over liters. Again, we'll go over it a little more slowly. So don't confuse molarity with molality. So I don't know who invented this, but they're only off by one letter there. So watch that. And so molality is the amount of solute in moles over the mass of solvent in kilograms. So some people say this is more accurate, but honestly, I don't see people using molality a lot in uh, practice, at least not with my area of chemistry and research and anything. And then we have mole fraction. So I think we've seen mole fraction before. So again, we'll go over it. That, so that's just amount of solute in moles over total moles. So notice that's total. And then we can take our mole fraction and turn it into a percent. 
So they're pretty related there. And then we'll look at parts by mass. And so you may have done this in lab. And, um, or you can have these different variations of this. So it could be parts by mass, so mass over mass. It could be mass per volume, like was given in your lab. And if you haven't gone to lab, you can grab one and kind of see. Well, there's different variations of that. So parts, so you could do gram per volume. And then we'll look at these other ones as well. So parts per million, parts per billion. So these, of course, often come up in like water quality reports, but we'll be able to quantify that a little better. All right, so let's start. Well, how do we prepare a solution? And this is kind of cool because this is what right our stock room has to do for us. And so they know, right, like the amount of solution. So like, let's take this week's lab. So they know that we're preparing, you know, a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution. They calculate, you know, how many students are, how many stations. So they know total amount, and then they have to, of course, prepare the stock solution. And so let's go through this little example. And so again, it depends what's needed. And so the stock room has some prep sheet with my lab instructions, and it says, right, whatever they need to make. And so this would be an example of a weight by weight solution. And so let's say it says you need a 5% by mass. And this just means right weight by weight. So mass by mass solution. And so all that means is I want five grams of solute and 100 grams of solution total. And so let's look at this other example. And so now in this little example, it's saying that we want to make a one molar sodium chloride solution. And so this goes through just how to properly make it. And so notice we make it in a volumetric flask. And so a volumetric flask is designed to only measure one measurement. So in this case, they use a one liter volumetric, so it's extremely accurate for one liter, so it has just a nice little line there, but that's all that it measures. And right, you have different volumetric flasks and different sizes, depending on what you need. And so let's kind of break this down. So if it's one molar, so we said molarity is moles over liters. And so in this case, right, if we want one liter, then we need one mole. And so then, right, we have to convert our moles to mass. So if we're doing sodium chloride, that ends up to be 58.44 grams of sodium chloride. And so that's the first step. And so, right, let's say the stock room had to make a sodium hydroxide solution for us. So that would be the first step is figuring out how much sodium hydroxide, putting it into this volumetric flask. And then the next step is to add water until it's dissolved. So right, you'll probably swirl that around for a little bit, get it nice and homogenous. And once it looks pretty homogenous, then you want to, of course, very carefully take it to the one liter mark. And if you go over that one liter mark, right, you have to start all over again or else your solution is not accurate. And so that's kind of the key point. So, and then again, you put it to that line, so you get an eye level with it, drop it in really slowly, and then give it a final shake mix, and then you have your one liter, one liter of one molar solution. And so that's essentially, right, what the stock room has to do for us on a weekly basis. And so now let's look into molarity a little bit deeper. So molarity, again, that's just moles over liters. 
And so again, molarity describes how many molecules or atoms of solute are in each liter. So if we have a sugar solution that's two molar, right, that means we have two moles of sugar in every one liter. And two liters of that sample would, of course, have four moles of sugar. 0.5 liters would be one mole of sugar. So I'd probably write this down, star it. And so now I'm looking at the mole highway, but I realize I actually don't have what I was thinking about. So volume, this would be more for like, a, like let's say you're adding pure ethanol or something, because ethanol has a different density. But you could also like put under a side here volume and molarity. So you can make your own modified highway. So you might have to put like, Molarity, and you can go from molarity to moles as well. So keep that in mind. Okay, we'll have to make a new highway for ourselves. All right, so let's look at the next unit. So like I said, you probably won't see molality too much unless you do become an analytical chemist, then maybe they use it more. And... So this is why people say it is more accurate. So molality is, again, defined as moles per kilogram of solvent. And so again, that's kilogram of solvent. And so it's considered to be more accurate since it does not vary with temperature because it's based on mass, masses, not volume. So there could be right slight fluctuations, again, very, very slight. Um, fluctuations in volume, but again, unless you're an analytical chemist, I doubt you'll run into this too much. And again, so write it down and notice it's little m, so again, that's moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So let people write that down. And so then we have this parts in parts, like we mentioned, right? That could be mass by mass, weight by weight, volume by volume. And it could be in different units too. So just kind of right, keep that in mind and kind of pay attention to what the solute, uh, solution and question are both kind of saying. And so right, we could have a par percentage so percentage, that just means it's a part out of 100 parts, right? Because a percent is out of 100. So if a solution is 0.9% by mass, then we have 0.9 grams for every 100 grams of solution. And so now let's look at parts per million. And so we have this parts per million, and this is can be kind of confusing because it's right one part in a million parts. But that's sometimes cumbersome to use for conversions. And so I would use this one if ever you're trying to compare or convert. And so parts per million, so again, if parts per million is 1 times 10 to the 6, so then we can backtrack, well, why does this work? Well, milligrams is 10 to the negative third, right, times our base unit. Kilograms is 10 to the third. So if you divide them, so 10 to the third divided by 10 to the negative third, right, you end up with this factor of 10 to the sixth, or really one milligram per kilogram, which is that one times 10 to the sixth, sixth factor or again, one part in a million parts. Does that make sense?
And so with that, right, parts per billion is pretty similar. So again, it's one or however many parts in one times 10 to the ninth or a billion parts or solution. And again, for this one, so I like this microgram per kilogram factor. So microgram is 10 to the negative six, right? Kilogram is 10 to the third. So if you divide them, you get that 10 to the ninth factor. So you can do again micrograms to kilograms. And that gives us our parts per billion there. And so I think we've mentioned mole fraction at least briefly. But so mole fraction is, again, kind of how it sounds. So it's a fraction of the moles of one component over the total moles of all the components. So that was kind of like our gases, right? So you can think back to gases and the partial pressure chapter. So that's where we first talked about these mole fractions. And so again, right, we can look at a specific component. So if we're looking at A, you find the moles of A, obviously over the total moles. And in this case, it just says substance A and substance P, but you can have obviously more substances. And then it is unitless. And then again, we can take this mole fraction and convert it to a percentage as well. So whatever is more convenient to you, whatever you're using in your problem. And then, so this is the next kind of super important formula. So I would star this, highlight this, whatever. And so there's different forms of this. So I prefer this very general form. So all this is saying is our concentration of our first scenario times our volume one is equal to our concentration two times our volume. And it really doesn't matter what this concentration is in. So that's why I like this more general form, right? Because concentration could really be in any unit, same as volume, as long as they're consistent. And some people, right, they give you this more specific form. So this is your molarity times your initial volume is equal to your new molarity times your new volume. But again, it could be used for molality, it could be used for anything. So you don't have to just be committed to molarity. But often people just give you this form or books give you this form, but the more general one is acceptable. And it works, so it doesn't matter. And blah, 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 so again, right, you often see this M1B1 instead, but really same formula. And so this would be something else that the stockroom might do pretty often. And so right often, they either just have stock solutions, or this would be more for like an acid or something. So like acids, you buy them in like 12 molar stock solutions, and then the stockroom has to dilute it down for us. And so in this case, so let's first figure out Well, how much of our 10 molar solution do we need here? So answer that before we kind of reveal. So right, we have our C1, B1 equals C2, V2. And so it says we want to prepare 3 liters of a 0.5 molar solution from a 10 mil stock solution. So what's our volume of stock? So take a moment to try to figure that out.
Do we get an answer? All right, we can just call this our condition one. So write V1, C1. I'll just call this C2. We want V2. So then we just set this up, so three. And again, right, it doesn't matter our units as long as they're the same. So we're in three liters, 0.5 molarity, okay? And at least we're in molarity still. And we'll be getting out liters then. So we did three times 0 0.5 and then divided by 10. So did you get 0.15? So that would be liters. So then we can multiply it by right 1,000 if we wanted milliliters. So either way, so I'll write, so X is 0.15 liters or 150 milliliters. And so now looking at this, so again, same sort of situation. So in this case, if we were doing a dilution, you start with your 150 milliliters of our stock. And so then we'd put it into our little volumetric again. And so notice if they want three liters, they're choosing a three liter volumetric here. And then you just dilute it. So you'd probably want to, you know, take it a little bit, dilute it, swirl it around, and then finish. And of course, take it to the top nice and slow so you don't go over. And so again, our stock room does this for us. So give them a big thank you. All right, let's try this one. So this could be something else that our stock room does. So what volume should we dilute 0.2 liters of a 15 molar sodium hydroxide solution to get a 3 molar solution? So what do we get for this one, or what do we do? So 
right? We still have our C1, so this can still be V1 here. And then we're trying to figure out, well, what's V2, right, for a new volume if we want a 3 molar solution. So we have 15 molar, 0.2 liter equals 3 times X here. So what do we get when we solve this? by three. So do we get one liter there? We can everybody get a liter. And so we get we should take this down to one liter divided by five there. Any questions on that one? Oh, did you have a question or? No. All right, so the last little bit, so let's see. So we'll finish, hopefully today we'll get through all this. If not, that's fine. But then Wednesday we'll do practice because you might be able to tell where this is going. So, of course, we can then do our wonderful equations that people love with stoichiometry except with solution chemistry as well. So we'll do some of that practice on Wednesday, putting it all together. All right, let's see how far we can make it. So we have freezing point depression. And so, right, what does that mean? So the freezing point of a solution is lower than the freezing point of a pure solvent. And you saw that in lab, right? So you took your little uh, ice and then you put salt in it and you kind of compared the one with just ice versus the salt and ice. And so you probably saw that that salt solution, salt ice solution, got lower in temperature. And so we'll look at the math behind that. But basically what's happening is we have our nice crystal structure of water. And then we put our sodium chloride or whatever salt in there. And of course that disrupts our crystallization. And so now the temperature has to be lowered for that solution to freeze. And of course, right, the more solute, so the more stuff you put in your pure water, the lower that freezing point goes. And so this is just kind of the math behind it. And so we'll look at this math. And so ironically, I said we hardly use molality. Well, this is one case where we might use molality. Again, it all depends on what your KF is given in. So in this case, the KF is related to molality. And so the units of KF in this case, again, in this book, are degrees Celsius per molality. And so we can appreciate that, again, on this curve. So this is a phase diagram. And so, right, we have solid liquid gas. And so our pure solvent is in blue here. So we can kind of highlight so where our pure one is. And so now let's kind of zoom in. And so right all along this line here, so it's the liquid solid phase. So this is where melting occurs. So this would be right melting or normal melting. Normal. So all along this line is where melting is. And so notice right with the solution, so it's called freezing point depression. And that line is just moved on this phase diagram. So now, again, we just have to go at a lower temperature to still freeze that same solution. And 
So again, right, this is why we salt the roads, or really here they more like dirt the roads. But So what's the problem with adding salt? Let's talk about kind of more bigger environmental big pictures. So what's the problem with salt? and why we probably don't want to use too much salt on the roads. Where does that salt water go? What's the problem with salt? Why doesn't Oregon use too much salt out here? So it does rust the cars. That is a good point. So that's, let's add that. So right, salt. So salt does cause rust, right? And so I don't know if you're aware of that, especially if you have never been out east. So out more like east, they use a bunch of salt. And so that salt just speeds up the oxidation process of the undercarriage. And so either you have to like wash your car a lot in the winter, which sounds counterintuitive, or you know you end up with a rusty car. So just be careful if you, of course, you're purchasing a car secondhand and it's been somewhere in these snowy conditions. But what else is a problem with salt? So, okay, it's destructive. What else does it do though? Where else does it go? <laughs> well, it goes back into the water, right? So we can think about, so what happens, you know, we pour a bunch of salt on the roads, and especially, you know, in Oregon, we're pretty close to our river sources. So either they're going to Bear Creek and then eventually ending up in the Rogue River, which all ends up in our freshwater. And so that's really the other problem is the freshwater contamination. And so, right, unfortunately, that salt is just going to contaminate all the rivers, all the streams. And so, yes, it does, you know, do freezing point depression. Obviously, that helps us. But we probably want to be careful with it. So I do give props to Oregon for just doing all the dirt and the gravel instead. But something to be conscious of, so don't go too crazy spreading salt everywhere. Got to think about that water. All right, so then this is just different freezing point and boiling point constants. And so first we just talked about freezing point. So that's that KF that we just said. And so this would be the solvent. And so right, mainly we're looking at water for aqueous solutions, but in case, you know, benzene came up or carbon tetrachloride. So notice again, they just have different KF values. And so let's try this. And so let's go back to the formula. And so notice, right, what this is giving you is your change in freezing point. So whatever you get, just take your normal freezing point and uh, subtract that. So let's see if we could try that out and practice word interpretation. So it says, what is the freezing point of a 1.7 molality solution of aqueous ethylene glycol? So make sure you use a right KF.
So do we get an answer for this one? So what do we use for KF? Which value? Olivia, which one did you pick? So we got our keyword of aqueous. So which one did it want? Lexi, do we know? What was aqueous referring to? Water. Water. So right, that's that was the tricky part of this question is we had to know to choose this one for aqueous. So some people got confused by ethylene glycol, at least in the past, and we're trying to look for ethylene glycol on here. But it's just aqueous, right? So this is our solvent. So this is telling us, right, solvent. So this is... Even though ethylene glycol, so this is just antifreeze, so it could be used as a solvent, but in this case, right, it is our solute. And so all we need then is to plug in those values. So we have our KF, and again, right, because it's degrees Celsius, molality, so that's looking good there. It's just always good to double check your units of everything. And so now this gives us, right, a change in temperature. So let's calculate that. So 1.86 times 1.7. And so this gives us, right, a delta T of 3.16, roughly. But then, right, we said freezing point depression. So we have to do zero minus that. And if you forgot, the freezing point, so it says normal freezing point of water, so zero. We should know it, but again, it's okay if we forgot. Oops. And, and of course, that gives us then our new freezing point is negative 3.16. All right, I think in the interest of time, We'll stop there. So you can get a preview. So we'll continue with boiling point elevation. So basically, we'll see how their boiling point is higher. We'll do the math, but we'll pick up there. And again, check your grades. Check your grades. Check if those aren't your homeworks. If they are, just let me know so I can credit you. And then otherwise, I will see you Wednesday. And of course, stick around, ask questions if you need help on anything. I'll go ahead and stop this stream.